is the tympano is that the is that the marta piece oh i know it's a different one i'm writing my own um oh okay sorry i just saw um, the I saw so, uh, the stuff so what we thinking. just learned is that caleb doesn't feel comfortable going for that last name pronunciation either <laughs> nobody knows what it is marta p <laughs> Yeah, I'm about to pee. It's totally fine. <laughs> Seriously, though, is, with me. What's is, up? The, is the pee silent? I've never known. No, it's not. It's so it is Patizinska. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, 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 like pterodactyl. <laughs> nice. Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ad Percussion Podcast, episode 340. We almost have an episode for you to listen to every day of, you know, within a year and learn something new, which is just amazing. Um, my name is Ksenia Komlenovic, and I will be your host today. And with me are my wonderful buddies, Benjamin Charles. Hey, Ksenia, how's your semester wrapping up? Oh, man, it feels like trying to stop a bullet train in a second so um yeah lethal how is yours <laughs> pretty much same yeah we're we're basically done now but it was it was a brutal end of the semester it was busy well you look great it doesn't show at all so oh thanks <laughs> what you're doing. <laughs> and then we have uh, our og casey cangelosi hey what's up everybody hey how are you casey how's the end of the semester for you Good, typical, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty chill. So, um, fine, thanks. Yeah, it becomes chill when you get tenure, I guess. Everyone, that's that's it. Otherwise, you arrive to the finish line screaming like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if stuff has changed much since tenure, but um, it it was crazy for the students. I think they all played at VMEA, and they like just brought the house down that's Virginia Music Educators Association like a ton of our groups played and it was like yeah just like super super duper good and um so I don't know they're probably yeah like drop dead exhausted but um yeah yeah it was great Oh, good. Congratulations. Congratulations, Thanks. Professor. You killed it. Master, master. He's killing it. Um and then we have uh Casey's impersonator. Caleb Pickering here. If you're not on YouTube, you should uh, tune in because they somehow telepathically communicate and always dress the same. But anyway, Caleb, hey, what's up? Hey, <laughs> how much? How are you? <laughs> See, you go, you go for those jokes, so you get a long pause. You have to edit out. I'm gonna do that occasionally to make your life harder. <laughs> Wow, this is this is what true love is, everyone. Uh, this is how we operate around here. Um, how are you doing? You're working on some new music. You have some scary big sheets, sheets, sheet. Yeah, some indoor stuff and some uh, uh, thing for UNT and some other little ensembles and solos. So staying busy, but it's good. I don't know about y'all, but the end of my semester is, I, I look forward to it. I mean, it's coasting for me. I mean, week before finals, we're just reviewing. Finals week is different and low stress. Juries, I just have to show up and listen. Easy money. <laughs> that's nice. I have a competition that I'm organizing that's happening next weekend. So that's right. No easy. Hear us. Yeah. So it's it's happening. But uh, good to hear everyone is doing well. Um, so this episode uh, drops on December eight and music history uh, marks this day as John Lennon's final day. Um, it is also my final day on this podcast, only as a producer, um, and uh, it will be a celebration. It will be way better than John Lennon's last day, because um, he had a photo session with Annie Leibovitz and then went to mix Yoko Ono's uh, music and then got shot. Um, I'm not going to leave the house after this, so I'll be, I'll be okay. Uh, but, um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you, you tied those things together so smoothly, Ksenia. nice job. <laughs> and that's how I got fired from the podcast. She's not getting fired just to be clear. 
<laughs> this is her last time like editing an episode all that <laughs> <Yeah>. means <laughs> and that's why Caleb is making it extra uh difficult for me but anyway um that was looking in the past and today what we're going to talk about is the future we want to look into the future and um when thinking about what I want to do for this episode I thought about how it would be amazing to get everyone's opinions. Um, our community, the podcast community is amazing. And they happily contributed a lot of ideas of what are some things that we could look forward to in the future? Or what are things that we should focus on uh, getting better at so that we could have a smoother, better life and be better people and better musicians? So um, this is one of the best ways, in my opinion, to get, say goodbye to 2022 or this chapter in our lives and just move on. So uh, I wanted to have a lot of guests in the Zoom room today, but of course, that's a bad idea. We all know that for Zoom, um, which is why we have one guest in person, but the rest will get their voice heard through video messages. And I'm really grateful for those. So our guest today is Melissa Wong. Uh, Melissa and I met uh, because she reached out to me as she completed a project of recording works by female BIPOC and LGBTQ plus composers. And the three videos that she sent, uh, these works by Marta Ptoszynska, Gregory Jackson, and Yaz Lancaster were done beautifully. And I thought how Melissa would be an excellent example of a young person who does something to bring a better future to the world. Sort of like be the change that you wanna see, that Mahatma Gandhi thing. I think Melissa is a big part of that. So Melissa, welcome to the podcast. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Ksenia. And thank you, Ben, Casey, and Caleb for joining. And thank you so much for this opportunity. And I just said thank you three times, but I really <laughs> appreciate it. That's in a different wording now. Um, uh, and yes, as Ksenia mentioned, I just finished a recording project um, and it's a long title, but it's called Percussion Works by Women, BIPOC and LGBT, LGBTQ+. Let me say that again. Percussion Works by Women, BIPOC and LGBTQ+. And this um, opportunity was granted by a grant um, from Northern Illinois University and um, by the Reed Grant, which is the research, um, the research engagement and academic diversity grants. Um, I'm really fortunate that they were able to help out financially with the project and as well as the um, support of uh, a video and sound company named No and Eva, uh, Name Two Boats Media, and this includes Noah and Yvonne Streaker from the company. And yeah, that's um that's the story so far. Uh, the recording sessions did take forever <laughs> to complete, and um, uh, but it was well worth the process. And I'm super grateful for everyone who was involved in this. So, can you tell us then, uh, because this was such a huge laborious process and you shared with me that you already played the these works live why did you decide to record them um so uh on my senior recital my senior undergraduate recital at northern illinois university um first of all that was my I guess my second recital at the university because uh, to complete the um, education and performance um, degree. Um, and I was surfing through, uh, you know, YouTube, going down to the deep webs, and um, I started looking for repertoire. And I went into this deep hole of trying to find repertoire that has not been played yet. And this involved just me looking at the sidebar of videos that we suggest you to watch. And sooner, sooner, the sooner I got into the videos with maybe like a hundred views or so, the more on the side at that time popped up more videos that were fewer views such as that. And slowly I began to find so many, so much new music. Um, that I've never heard before and composers I've never heard before. And as a result, 
that had that was the majority of my recital and by coincidence um uh and maybe it isn't coincidence it was by choice that i found these you know the this music and then selected them um but it was almost it was a coincidence that most of these were underrepresented communities and originally the title was going to be um, percussion works by underrepresented composers, but my hope is that these um, composers are not in the underrepresented category anymore, and so therefore I changed the name to a way longer title, but um, I feel like it really um, covers the umbrella of the communities that are um, that are underrepresented, which were women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ+. Um, and then so uh, when I gathered a lot of these pieces, so there are three pieces, which was by Mota Patinska, um, uh, probably botched that um, pronunciation, um, Yaz Lancaster and Gregory Jackson. Um, and then there was, in the recital, there were two more pieces by composed by me. Um, one was uh, kind of like a joke piece, a meme piece in a way, um, uh, kind of to lighten the mood at the end. And um, there was also another uh, piece called Three Short Songs by Constantine Vlasis. Um, obviously he is, he, was, he is what you would consider, you know, a white man. And uh, therefore, also because of the time commitment and the amount that the grant offered in the first place, I would have only been able to do three pieces anyway. So in, instead of, you know, making myself the star and putting my pieces on there, um, I decided three um, uh, composers who were um, under the umbrella of either women, BIPOC, or LGBTQ+. Um, I also collaborated with uh, uh, performers, or well, I guess a performer, um, James Gibson um, on Steel Pan on Disarm. So I feel like I should give him some credit for learning the piece and recording with me as well. Absolutely. That was wonderfully done. Ben. Melissa, I just had a question. Um, I, well, first of all, I wanted to give a shout out to PAS has a few wonderful databases that if anyone's interested in programming underrepresented composers, uh, you can find some great pieces on those. And I was looking at those like literally a week ago and discovered Yaz Lancaster and was like, so impressed. <laughs> um, and I, I found a, a few other pieces. Um, and uh, Eastman at PASIC played a piece by the composer Jalen um who, who i found some of her works and was super impressed by also um but i was wondering what in particular drew you to these uh composers uh what drew me to mocha first um spider walk was the piece that i performed um what drew me to that piece in particular was even though it was a kind of old piece written in the 90s um uh, I really appreciated the different sounds, and I was super, um, I was super captivated by when um, when the performer would hit the cowbell, and the cowbell would be mounted on top of the a timpani, or yeah, a, tim a timpano, and when you hit it and you change the pitch of the timpano, then it makes us. Ooh, 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 sound, and I thought that was super, super cool. Um, so that's what attracted me to that piece. And also a lot of performance performers' um, choice of the Elm Glocken pitches, which actually, so I, um, it, what's related to this grant also was that I interviewed the composers individually, which I'm very fortunate that they are um, living and, and that they were able to talk about their pieces and about themselves. And, and I, when I talked to Mota, she actually mentioned she didn't want a lot of the pitches that were on most of these YouTube performance videos. She wanted like a wider variety of um, Glocken, uh, pitches of Elm um, Glockens, wider variety of Taigongs, um, and a lot, of, a lot of things that I really enjoyed about the performances of other people was actually what she didn't want to see um, in in the it wasn't part of her vision in her work. And then what drew me to uh, Gregory Jackson's Temptation of Christ? Um, first of all, it was a clickbait title. That's why I clicked it. Um, and second of all, he played it was such a badass um, piece. He played it himself on a YouTube um, on a YouTube video and um, I just found the chords, and it was very 
Keiko Abe esque. Um, I just thought that the 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 con the composition. Um, I'm super into badass pieces, and I kind of considered his uh, his works badass. So I was like, I need a badass marimba uh, solo for my recital, and I should totally program this. Um, and then third for Jisam, uh I really enjoyed the extended techniques such as the bowing of the vibraphone and then the um, uh, when you use like a mallet to push down the keys and bending the pitch of the uh, vibraphone. I love that. I love that sound super much. And uh, I think we need a word count of how many times I've said super. I think it's four times, but um, I love that piece a lot, uh, especially with the incorporation of the steel pan. So um, Northern Illinois University has a huge, um, has a really popular steel pan program. Um, Liam Teague directs it. Um, and they're about to celebrate their 50th uh, anniversary at, uh, in a couple months, which is super cool. Um, I'm not involved in it because I'm not at the Midwest anymore. I'm in Washington. So, um, but I'm super excited to see what uh, that, my mind just like went in 50 different directions. Um, but anyway, it feels like a weird plug that I'm giving, but I'm really excited to watch the 50th anniversary Steel Pan concert. It's, it's like so great to hear the passion in your voice when you talk about these pieces, because I know one of the databases talks about like, don't don't tokenize these composers. Like don't, don't just say like, well, well, I wanted a black composer on my concert. So I picked this piece. Yeah, it's like find great music that happens to be by these underrepresented groups and it sounds like that's exactly what you did i appreciate that comment i yeah i did notice a lot, like it's it, you know it's a constant um uh discussion about are, are we tokenizing you know composers or are we putting composers on a concert just because you know they're uh, underrepresented or do you actually like the piece well melissa i too really enjoy what ben said which is that you genuinely have such passion and you're so excited about this and I like the fact that you are unfiltered and just so bubbly about all of this and I think that's exactly where this stuff should go that you are marrying your great performance with the values that that you have and a genuine interest in this music and then you invested all this time to record it and now it's available for other people so I want to know what is the message that you wish sort of why would anyone record this stuff you know what why did you do it uh, what do you want people to get out of it uh, meaning and sort of what advice would you have for other young people who want to um, do something positive for the community in similar ways thank you for that great question thank you um so one of my goals for this project is, you know, to perform works by underrepresented communities, and that already is enough. Um, that's a step to um, a better world, in a sense. And and when you're playing that publicly, then other people are hearing that. And then when they hear that, then they'll be pretty much automatically inspired in a way it's like you know force you, well when you're in the room you're kind of forcing them to listen in a way um and then you want but you want them to listen to you know the wonderful works and that already is a step to inspire people um and another is another goal of this project was to encourage um, musicians and performers and listeners um to dive into the featured composers works and almost in a way um kind of like how I was clicking the um, suggested videos, um, hoping that they'll go into the rabbit hole of you know, looking more into the composers that were featured. Um, and also on the related tabs of uh, what other pieces are not performed as much um, and should be, and the, the works that you listen to that you like. Uh, and the last is to encourage uh, musicians to perform more works by underrepresented voices, which already there's, there's much more progress than in this topic than there was, you know, maybe even just three years ago. Um, and I'm really happy to see that uh, progress. Obviously, there's some, you know, communities that are still very, you know, um, uh, I love Bach, I love Beethoven, um, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's wonderful things to learn from their works. Um, but there's also an appreciation and realization that you can learn almost the same exact things from 
other composers as well. Um, and for uh, suggestions on uh, what young people can do if they want to like work on this kind of project. Um, first of all, um, for the not technical aspect, I'll go into like, um, I guess the most technical aspect I can talk about here is um, for young people, um, if you're not in a college and uh, maybe grants, uh, grants, um, because I was in college, uh, university, when I wrote wrote the grant, and I was I wouldn't have probably done it. I wouldn't have even known about the grant if my professor Greg Bayer didn't mention it. And it's all about um, you know uh, who talks to you and who mentions you know because I I could look it up, but I wasn't in the um, I wasn't, if I don't know what I'm looking for, then why would I want to look it up until someone tells me, you know, hey, you should totally look into this. And that helps with, um, what can help you with that is, this is kind of cliche, but you know, networking, but I, I don't really like to say networking because first of all, it's a cliche, but also it feels pretty superficial. Um, what I want to say is like, you sh people, young people should genuinely talk have a genuine interest to talk to people and learn about others on a human and personal level. Um, not every, everyone you talk to is going to be like, uh, or every, not every person you talk to shouldn't be because you want something from them. I believe the first step is that you really should know the person before you ask something from them, you know? Um, and from like a human personal genuine level uh then you can trade you know um maybe not trade but like you can trade what you know with the other person and it's great to learn about others and they'll learn about you um so speaking up uh and quote unquote networking or just literally just getting along with people <laughs> um uh that's one advice and I know talking to people can be hard, especially with people with anxiety. And um, but I there's a really weird thing I like to tell myself, which is um, the, so before I'm about to make a fool of myself, or before I'm about to put myself really out there, um, something I tell myself is, well, it's better to regret doing something than to regret not doing something. Because at least you know what the the answer what what happens is when you do the thing, but you're never gonna know the results of um, of of what you wanted to do if you don't do it if you don't even start. Um, so yeah, my 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 line that I tell myself is well better to regret something doing something than not regret doing something which I mean th this might this can sound unhinged but it's you know based on the settings where you're at um which is important in in that in that quote um and for young people to find you know uh how to make their projects come to life if you, you, you you're not at a financial place to do so you can um there are a lot of people you going back to the talking thing you can talk to your teachers and learn uh, and and learn from them what do they know that you don't what grant what what moments of what financial opportunities do they know that you don't because they are more likely the teachers are more likely to be in depth with um or, or to know about you know scholarship opportunities, and they can get emails if they're like um, signed up for certain organizations, um, emails or, or local scholarships on where you can get financial um, aid for to to make projects come to life. Um, oh, yeah, I think that's really much it of what I want to say. Like I said, I have very bad wood vomit, but I like that about myself. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I was just going to ask, I, I think, you, you know, of course, Melissa, but also everyone, I mean, you're, you're talking about creating new works and getting underrepresented composers seen, known, and I think most importantly, like continued to play. And it seems like, you know, all five of us in the room, we've seen kind of 
ebb and flows throughout our whole careers and we've seen pieces come and we've seen projects come and commissions it seems like every recital like someone's had a, at least one new piece written and maybe it gets played once and never played again never seen again so I just kind of ask everyone like what do you think is the most important thing like while you're giving advice to to people who want to follow in your footsteps Melissa what uh what do y'all think is like the most important thing to making pieces catch on like how do we get other people to want to play these pieces thank you for Casey for the great question um one step to uh to help people um play or you know like not have one piece be played once and then never again oh i played it once i guess that's it for you know um that's it for this piece um what can really help is first of all the first step is first thing i can recommend is making sure if this is a new piece that's never been played or it's a piece that has only been played once or twice in the past making sure you um, being aware that no one else has heard of this, you want to, or that no one has likely heard this, you want to make sure you have the, the most unique interpretation of that piece, whether it's musically or even stage presence wise, or, um, and make that work come alive, um, in your own vocabulary and in your own unique um, sense. So like, um, I guess an example would be, um, you know, you. I mean, most of these composers are likely to be alive. You can even ask the composer, hey, is it okay if I can put blank, blank in? Um, not because, you know, your music sucks, but because I wanna have a uh, unique twist to it. And then when you have that unique twist, people are likely to catch on, They'll um, see it as unique or different and they will remember that piece and they will consider that piece and maybe even recommend it to their students um, uh, like professors or playing in other in other places um, I'm not sure if, if that answers your question too directly um, yeah yeah I think it is I mean I think if it's, it's your one thing is yeah make it make it really good you know and make it really I mean I think that's that's a a, a tenant of something that's unique. I mean, it stands out as unique because it's it's you, the performer connects to it, and yeah, like of course, it, people need to think it was really good for it to for it to catch on. Of course, Ben, what do you what do you think? I, there's this little axiom, and I, I think it might be from Alan Adi, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but just very short, and Casey, I think you've said it before. It's uh, play new music like it's old, and play old music like it's new. And I think like that's like a that great like very succinct way of putting it and just like to give a like great shout out like Ksenia just played her right of spring arrangement at PASIC and it was like you know like you're on the edge of your seat like it was very exciting performance of an old piece but also like a new piece at the same time so um but yeah I think that little tiny little saying is like the perfect way of like summing up like don't play Bach like it's boring old music and don't play new music like oh well yeah it's a new piece I'm gonna get like one performance out of this we'll see if people like it yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, but I was going to say, of course, what Melissa did is a great gift to a composer. If you can make them an awesome recording so yeah. they can use that later, I mean, to promote their music, even when there's no live performances going on, if that happens. So that's I, I was I was just going to suggest my idea. Like, I, I feel like all, I've seen a lot of pieces come and be great and they don't stick around because they require something nobody has or they're like over cumbersome or like th there's something you know uh, I, I think when to all the young people out there like when you're considering commissioning something like if you want the piece to catch on and stick around consider like what it's for and how hard it is and how practical it is and just imagine like yeah like do you see you know thousands of people like yourself going like oh yeah cool I, I can I can play that yeah I have all that stuff or I can at least get it or or oh yeah I can like play those rhythms 
or they they make that instrument it's easy to get i mean there's been so many of these things i've seen where it's just like oh yeah you need this like one gong that like really you'd have to like like i wrote this piece for this metronome that like nobody has and it's like like if you were if you were a university teacher in the 70s you might have one and it gets played like it gets it gets played way more than i expected it to but like yeah i didn't expect it to get played like at all you know and it doesn't get played much and it's like yeah it makes sense nobody has the thing you know so i don't know it's like i think when you're a lot of times i i see people are so free spirited in their commissioning process and they're just like oh yeah whatever whatever it's like yeah cool i know you want them to like think you're really laid back and like cool above all but maybe like maybe make sure you're you know you're really thoughtful in like what you're asking for you know if you want the piece to stick around yeah, yeah. yes that's absolutely. that's my that's my my answer to the question but that's my own question so <laughs> There, there definitely are rules to survival of music, and you want to um, sort of employ as many of those so that just the piece has a, a chance of living. Um, there's that, there's that great piece by Nigel Westlake, Fabian Theory. Do you guys know mm -hmm. this piece? Mm -hmm. And it's like you have to have a setup with a microphone that has it like puts a delay on the marimba, and so there's like this uh, little delay effect, and it has to repeat at like a certain like point seven seconds or something like that. Uh, and they don't make the delay pedal mechanism, whatever, anymore. So you either have to like find a very old, probably from like the 80s one, or like find a new one that will replicate that exact effect. So it's a great piece, but it doesn't cool. get played nearly as much as it should because there's that weird tech requirement. Yeah. Uh, and that you can't predict in the future if that's going to happen or not. <laughs> <laughs> like that's really tricky. I think most things still exist. I mean, like, I know Max MSP hasn't been updated in a while, but it can do anything, any effect you want. Yeah, I mean, you would, and you would hope people would would take the effort to, yeah, to be figure out how to do enough, it. Yeah. yeah, right. Like you would hope, and of course, yeah, like delay. Yeah, I mean, there's like, I mean, I bought a delay plugin two days ago. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, delay is like super, super common and accessible, but yeah i mean a lot of people they're like wait a, a a delay plugin what what are you talking you know i mean they they it, yeah you just have to consider like for a piece to stick around like you got to talk about i mean thousands of people like will, will need to play it you know it's interesting yeah exactly <laughs> i feel like it's the thing it's the old adage about you've got to write something that's everything to someone or something for everyone like Bone Alphabet doesn't get played much at all. Newsflash, if anybody didn't know that. No. Uh, I mean, I mean, compared to Meditation Number One, you know, I'm pretty sure Meditation One has racked up more than Fernie Howe has, but yeah. More than Taylor Swift. Nope. <laughs> nope, that's incorrect information. Cassinia, I think this will be your last episode. <laughs> but it <laughs> But, but I mean, it is interesting, like, because uh, you, you, sometimes you see a new piece hit the shelf. Like, I think of that piece, Spine. Like, we played it when you were here, Caleb. Like, Senya played it recently. Like, I feel like that piece arrived and, like, boom, everybody played it the next, like, the next day, you know? And, of course, a huge part of that, I think, is what Ksenia said. It's, it's like, yeah, we should have, like, a great recording. Like, bam, so people know. And, like, I look at that spider walk piece, Melissa, it's like, I imagine a lot of people are going to want to play that. It looks so great. It sounds great. Like you did just like an excellent job. Like everything about it is so attractive. Um, it's like, you know, I imagine that's going to do very similarly, but I mean, it is, it's just, it's, um, it's kind of mysterious, but I think it's also not that mysterious. Like there's a lot of not too mysterious things like really in place and we just have to follow them, you know, and it's like, yeah, make a killer recording, do a killer performance and make sure the piece is practical and doable for a lot of people if your primary concern is for it to catch on you know that's all well said boss well said boss thank you thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you for the wisdom um thank you also melissa for being with us today and for sharing um this wonderful gem of your journey and we're rooting for you and uh good luck with with everything else now as you continue through your education 
Thank you so much. Have a great uh, week. Again, weekday. Um, yeah, <laughs> you guys, I think you guys had a great break too. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you too. I'll catch you, you guys too. later. Bye. Catch you later. Bye. <laughs> All right, so we can now move along to um, the other folks that I've solicited their input in imagining a better future for us all. So. I have several videos to share, and in between we have some Instagram messages, so we'll share those too. So let me start off here with our friend Bartek Miller from Poland. This is Bartek's message for percussionists. Hey guys, it's Bartek Miller, percussionist from Poland, and I have some quick thoughts to share with you about percussion playing overall. So let's start. Phrasing is everything. And in this way, articulation, dynamic, and rhythmical interpretation is everything. More singing, less hitting. Very important also. Breathe. You have to breathe constantly, as often as possible, and be aware of it. Don't play percussion, play music. Don't think that you are hitting something, but more that you are creating sounds, and be gentle with it. Engage your full body to perform music also. Sing everything that you are playing, even on drums, snare drums, etc. Sing every, every, everything. Tom-toms and every other skin instruments are not less musical instruments than mallet instruments, for instance. Very important to keep that in mind. Be natural, don't overthink, try to be always as relaxed as possible. Listen to what you're playing. And percussion is not just rhythm. Very important. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. It's just rhythm. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's just rhythm. Come on. Well, so when I asked the question, of like, what do you think is really important? And how, what would you like to see percussion turn into? And Bartik was like, we need to stop hitting things. We need to start playing music. And uh, I, I agree. I think that's a really nice shift in, in thinking for a lot of people is to go between going, thinking, hey, I'm a percussionist to, hey, I'm a musician. So... Well, it's interesting. Else? I mean, I, I I think we all agree, of course, and that's one of the the qualities that makes you know it's like the old easy comment you made the snare drum sing or you know I mean we we hear that that's often a, a praise we we hear um, and it, it's interesting that you know you often hear string instruments trying to be more percussive They're like they have like a string section has trouble being clean you know they it's like something we have a very easy time doing. If you're playing snare drum, yeah, you just being clean and being percussive is so easy, but singing is really hard. Likewise, string instruments singing much easier than than being percussive and being clean. It's like, yeah, we're, we're it's, it's it's fascinating that we're always trying to do the thing our instrument doesn't inherently do really well, and somehow that makes it fascinating and interesting. I have just a quick two second version of that statement, but with my students, a lot of the time I use the phrase "stroke don't strike." I think it's a good way of, of putting it. Wow. Look at Ben. He's full of one-liners. I, I find myself always, I'm just like, just put it where it goes. And they're like, well, should I like phrase this way? Should I phrase that way? Like, I don't know. Just put <laughs> just it hit where the it right goes. <laughs> just please hit it where it goes. Like, but it's Bach. Shouldn't I? Man? I'm like, I don't, I just, oh God, please just hit it where. <laughs> that's what that's what I find. <laughs> that has to be there first. Just put it where it goes. You heard it here first, people. <laughs> awesome. Now we move along. We have, uh, we had a lot of uh, questions and concerns about accessibility to instruments, to music and so on. And I'm gonna share uh, some of these. So let's start off with Diego. Hi, I want to talk about three different aspects that I see that are the most common one in Latin America and specifically in Mexico when we want to study music and becoming a professional. The first one is that we don't have enough universities. In most of the cases, we need to move to the capitals or the biggest cities to get a proper education on the gear that we need to to play percussion and and know all the instruments and, and ways to develop our, our jobs and that gives me to the second thing that it's that all the mallets methods uh sheet music and everything are so expensive so we become 
from middle and low class families that don't have that kind of support in arts or the notion that we need a lot of stuff that are real expensive, you know, as a marimba, as uh, even if in uh, buying new music, it, it's, it's really expensive for, for students. And that uh, drives me to the third one, that is that we don't have enough notion that we are a family as a, and as a family, we need to support of different members and specifically the new composers and the people that want to uh, explore new ways to see music, sound, uh, performance, interdisciplinary arts, you know, that kind of stuff that grow the contemporary art. And we need to support them and grow with, with them. And I think that those are mainly the three things that crossed my mind right now. And yeah, thank you for the space. Uh, this is something that I have also firsthand experience is, you know, coming from a, a country where the financial standards are really nowhere comparable to the U.S. and the U.S. being on the forefront of development in percussion and in repertoire is just that, I mean, I could not afford to buy new music, for example, at all. If the average salary is $200 and the score is 40 then it's it just becomes really difficult now through the help of my professor and you know if you're at the university and the university happens to have money and they will buy it then fabulous it'll live in the library and you'll have access to it but this is just something that a lot of our friends who are not as fortunate um, to live in in places that can uh, provide financial support uh, need help with so I was wondering what you thought of that I think also this this isn't really what you asked but to flip the the thing on its head. Uh, I remember hearing a, a drum set clinic from Ignacio Barroa, who is Cuban, and he said that when he was a kid in Cuba, you would sit on the roof and turn your you know, radio antenna toward the US and try and pick up a radio station. And you would hear Miles Davis and you would just transcribe as fast as you could. Mm -hmm. And he said after 30 seconds, it would click out and you'd be on static. And mm -hmm. he said like those 30 seconds became like the most precious thing ever because it's it's all you could get uh and i know like casey has talked about before like we used to like have to buy a cd and you would get this evelyn glennie cd because it had a rhythm song on it and that's what you wanted to hear but it came with 10 other tracks and because you had already paid 20 dollars to buy the cd and ship it like you listened to it until you i mean it, the disc was worn out basically i mean it was like so precious and now with like in the US, especially we have like streaming music, it's super easy to get. Um, yeah, mallets are like readily accessible and like even like a $15,000 Rosewood marimba in the US, like we just hit it and crack keys and we don't, it's not this like precious, like valuable thing. So I think that I don't have an answer for how we can help people in less fortunate circumstances, but I think that those of us that are privileged in these circumstances, like really need to appreciate what we have because, I mean, especially like Rosewood is such a precious resource at this point that's going to run out at some point. So that's my, uh, it doesn't answer the question I know, but that's my two cents on the topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, I completely agree, Ben. I mean, it, it's shocking to me sometimes what we see, uh, you know, over here, just like the difference in, people professionals and not I, I mean the, the fever at which they go after their goals versus the lack of fever I mean it's amazing what some people have and just don't utilize and don't take advantage of and still complain about I mean it's it's really really amazing I I think Ben you know you're right I mean like obviously like we can't do a lot for the whole problem, but I think it's really important for uh, for us, if you can do anything, um, do the little thing you can do. I mean, I know I've gotten that conversation before where, hey, someone pirated your sheet music and they say, well, I'm from Argentina or, or I'm from Mexico and I can't, music here is so expensive. And, and my answer is always like, hey, I've never not given music to someone who said they can't afford it. 
I, I, I don't mind my music going somewhere for free, but I want that to be my choice. So to the people in need, I would say, gosh, ask. I know if you, if you, I can't imagine you ask Caleb for a piece of music, he's not going to give it to you. I bet he will. Um, I know I will. And, and uh, wherever you can do a little thing like that, do it. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, Diago said, you know, about our community and our, our percussionists and musicians as a family. I mean, yeah, do the little thing you can. I mean, if we all do a little thing, it should make a big difference for people. So if you can give away some mallets because you have signature mallets, if you can give away a piece of sheet music because you're your own publisher, if you're hosting a podcast today and you can give a platform or a quick two minutes to hear a, a request from someone and it costs you nothing, uh, great. You know, so yeah, good on Ksenia for doing that. I mean, I, I think we all just have to do the, the little givings where we can. I just wanted to give a shout out to one of my former teachers, Mark Ford, I remember did a clinic, I wish I could tell you where, but in some other country other than the US. Um, and mallets are like way more expensive, you know, internationally. And so he took all of their mallets back to the US with him, sent them to Innovative Percussion to be rewrapped and mailed them yeah. back. Yep. Yep. Oh, that's lovely. Oh my God. That's and really you, lovely. I mean, and people do this stuff all the time. I mean, you, you hear keep digging you'll hear these stories i mean we just have to keep it up you know like yeah if you're not doing something do do what you can you know i mean mark is so tight with the people at innovative he can do that you know i mean that's him doing exactly what i'm saying i mean he's able to do something like that if you can you you should yeah that's wonderful. That's really hopeful. And thanks for sharing again, Diego. And if there's anything we can do, always reach out. It never hurts to ask. So we all want to help each other out. Um, awesome. So we move on now to our buddy Brady here. If I had a music school curriculum to completely redesign, uh, at least for percussionists, I would probably talk more about professional skills. Uh, and so this is professional things that are relevant not just to sort of playing our instrument but also to sort of existing as a professional so i guess on one front it would be about attaining proficiency before mastery or artistry and i guess that means maybe not as um, artistic a solo but maybe more thoroughly applying fundamentals to things like sarone etudes and peter's etudes which is actually really foundational especially to music education majors since they're going to end up teaching that repertoire anyway uh, and then um also talking about professional skills, whether it be like how to build a resume, write a cover letter. Um, and for me, when I do this type of stuff with my own students, I try and correspond with them in as professional a manner as possible, try and perform with them as much as possible. And all of this is kind of about triaging, honestly, because 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, there was so much less great percussion repertoire. And so we could kind of do just teach orchestral rep and the few solo pieces that existed and the few chamber rep pieces that existed and the students would know everything. But now it's like, there are a thousand things to learn on every single instrument. There's tons of great solo repertoire and a lot of it's not necessarily appropriate, especially for undergraduates. So I think tailoring things to the students' professional skills, is something that I would completely redesign that I try and do within the confines of my own curriculum. So I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. All I've right. Got you got something? I've got one on that. I, I uh -huh. think he's he's absolutely right. And it, it seems like I it with all of social media, YouTube and everything, it's it's so clear like how much there is out there in percussion. And I know I've had to try to dial some students back and say, Yeah, you you just I don't think you can do all that. And they will name like five people they aspire to be like and say like oh but so and so plays this and so and so also plays this and this other person plays that and they go through five people and i say right but that's five different people each playing one thing that they're not all doing all five of those and they're like oh you're right and like oh my output needs to be more like well wait a minute let's look at one of these people and look at like their output over the last year and you see it's actually like way more dialed back than the the student is perceiving so yeah i mean i i totally agree it's like we, we gotta like be practical not everyone does everything not everyone plays everything 
even if you go into like one niche corner of percussion like marimba solo it's like gosh nancy zeltzman's rep is nothing like gordon stout's rep <laughs> gordon stout's rep is nothing like lee stevens rep i mean there's some crossover but there's more difference than there is crossover yeah and a lot of people had uh, things to share about the curriculum and how they change it. And I'm so glad that we're having these conversations so that we can learn from each other and bounce ideas and keep improving. So this is definitely something to, to think about. And thanks for sharing, uh, Brady. We, we cheer you on. Um, all right. We move along now to something related to um, equipment. All right, so one thing more should could change about the percussion industry is how percussion hardware doesn't seem to reflect the new standards of technology in other industries, such as the automotive industry, the outdoor industry, and the space industry, all of which are constantly developing new technology. I feel like lots of the technology those industries have developed could easily be applied to percussion hardware to drastically improve what we use on a daily basis. For example, I thought of height adjustment on keyboards I feel like it would be so much better if the new standard was to use hydraulics with an electronic button, which I know some companies have already done before. Uh, it would just make things so much easier than the standard uh, crank and screw system. I feel like that could also be applied to snare and tom stands, which are usually a pain to raise and lower when you have a drum already on the stand, which hydraulics would easily fix. And additionally, stands could be way lighter with the use of carbon fiber, uh, which is both really light and really strong. So I don't think it would compromise the integrity of any stands. That could also be applied to other uh, keyboard frames to make them way lighter, especially the ones that are meant to be broken down to travel with. Uh, carbon fiber is just really nice for that purpose. And those are just a couple of examples, but obviously there's so many other innovations that have been made in other industries that could be applied to percussion hardware. So anyone have any thoughts? I'm not the equipment master. A vibraphone <laughs> with a battery on it <laughs> that you can charge <laughs> and use the motor without an extension. If you've listened to the podcast, you've heard this rant from me. That's Sorry, go ahead, Gil. It's been a six year, seven year theme. A snare drum with a pedal <laughs> for the throw off so you can play Bartok. So you can just right. play that one piece because everyone yeah. just wants to play that, Ben. Yeah, I'm playing it in February, guys. Come on out. Sorry, Caleb, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, not not to take a stab at Will, but it's like comparing apples and trees. They're just they're just not comparable. They're they're those are multiple different industries. And we're talking multi, multi millions and billions versus Pearl, which is a millions of dollars company. But that's, you know, when uh, when I was with Majestic, we bought the, uh, or Casey got one of those reflection marimbas and they tried to make it cheaper, right? By reusing some parts that were used for other things. Because like, if you want to make that one part, you have to make the machine that makes that one part. And then that becomes a whole, I mean, I think we're in a pretty good spot and we're innovating all the time, personally. It's kind of, I would just add, it's kind of interesting. I mean, cause I think, yeah, of course it'd be great. Like, why don't we see more improvements and more changes? And, um, you know, I think the question is, yeah, why are, why are they so slow to come or why are they so, so difficult? And I think Caleb's of course onto it. It's, it's from the business side and the, the manufacturing side, of course. And um, it, it is interesting, like some some instruments, like I look at the the pricing of certain instruments, um, like like on Steve Weiss, let's say, you know, and you look at it, it's like, wow, the the little the little owl wood chimes are still like four dollars or something. Like this, they're the same price they were. I mean, I don't know, someone there could correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like, you, you know, like it is. Um, it's so it's so weird. It must be really difficult for companies to to do certain updates, you know, and whether that's Steve Weiss not updating that or the company providing those or whatever, but it's like, hey, if this is working, just keep cranking it out, you know, and um, I don't know. Yeah, business is, yeah, I guess just just complicated. And yeah, I wish they I, I wish that would happen more. Uh, I agree. I think some of it is obviously innovation and I 
think that for someone like Will, you would probably thrive if you collaborated with a company that makes instruments so that you could come up with these ideas and, and understand what all goes into making these things. But we also had a lot of people talk about how affordability of instruments is an, is an issue, obviously, with having to need a whole jungle of things. Um, and so on one end, we are improving, which means we're raising prices and so on. On another, we have to make things more affordable. And again, I, I thought it was really cool because I just made a blanket call for for videos and comments and input. And not a lot of people really repeated ideas from the others. It's like everyone had their own angle um, and their, their own topic that they wanted to discuss. So I think this is really, really cool. And again, Will, if you're the kind of person that understands all of this, then maybe you want to go and do an internship somewhere or you know work for a company and come up with these ideas and be the important voice and percussion that's going to keep pushing things forward, which is awesome. Um, I just want to add one like great example of what we're talking about is I remember reading about Lee Howard Stevens talking about the tuning plugs and marimba resonators. And, you know, you think like, oh, yeah, you just need something to like move the, you know, make the resonator slightly longer or shorter. But he said, basically, like, you come up with a design and it leaks or you come up with a great design, but there's how many resonators and it costs $50 for each resonator. And so the price is just unaffordable. So yeah, like the the reson like movable resonator plugs are a great example of like, yeah, the marimba can't. I mean, it's already expensive. A marimba can't cost forty thousand uh, dollars. So how do you make those cheap enough that they you know are affordable but also that work well? So yeah, the reflect the that new majestic marimba Caleb mentioned does do that uh, very very well. That's the that's the first convincing like really easily and sustaining moving resonator plug. Not to not to plug my company, but hear that plug that's it. That's awesome. I'd love yeah. to. I'd love to see it uh, in person sometime. That's really cool. And move along, and now we have Nathan. Hey everyone, what's up? My name is Nathaniel Holman. I'm a Chicago-based percussionist and educator. And by Chicago, I mean the suburbs because no one knows the suburbs. So I'm out in the Wheaton Naperville area, teach at four different high schools and middle schools. And then I also play with Heartland Marimba. It's a good time. Uh, but to, to kind of like talk about my ideas about how to make percussion better in general, I'm thinking more in the high school level at the moment because that's what I'm saturated in. And it's where a lot of us start. It's our foundation. So the foundation needs to be good. But how can we make foundations good at the high school level when there's not that much attention given to percussionists? Now, I know some high schools kind of do the thing where they pull the kids out of band and they have them do this or that. But I think that that needs to be more standard across across most high school music programs. I mean, I spent most of my time in high school in band counting rests and just kind of goofing off in the back and not really doing much when really there was totally space to be used to have us taking lessons, have us playing a percussion ensemble, doing doing anything else besides just sitting and waiting. I mean, there was a at percussion podcast with the uh, PAS pedagogy group that said, I mean, do you ever think about the fact that band warmups are only really catered towards all the wind players? So just think about the reallocation of time in that regard. So at one of the schools I work at, uh, they, they pull kids out of band twice a week, once for uh, percussion ensemble, which I direct, which is great because now they're not sitting and counting, they're actually playing chamber music and learning how to count with each other. And also too, uh, they pull them out for lessons. So I teach during the day, during uh, a lot of the kids' band classes. So that's, not only does that help the kids have consistent lessons, but it helps me because now I'm not juggling this parent has this going on and then Johnny got sick and Melissa has volleyball. And so now all of this after school stuff, which I've been trying to do switches and that, and then, oh, but that money, and now I have to transfer that. It just gets too confusing. So the more we can have these band like pull up programs where the, the percussionists can do things during the school day, the way more it helps educators lives and scheduling, the way more it helps the consistency with the students lives and the less it takes off of the parents backs worrying about getting their kid to here and doing this and doing that. So I think that that needs to be standard across the board. The second thing I just want to talk about, which I guess percussions don't have that much control over, but it's more budgeting and helping band directors understand where percussion is going. One of the high schools I work at, they have all of these amazing instruments. They have a five octave marimba, it's beautiful. Well, all of their programs are done after school. So it's really hard to keep things consistent with this lesson or do this and this. Now the school I teach at where I'm there during the day, they have these percussionists who are really, really good and they're taking lessons, they're, they're very serious and they're, they've outgrown 
the four and a third marimba that they're on. And not only is it a four and a third marimba, but it's a Kilan Yamaha marching one. So it's really hard to be finessed and learn how to be musical on some of those uh, marching instruments, but the school wants to spend a hundred thousand plus dollars on uniforms. So I think we need to, as educators, start to let band directors know, hey, like the, the tides are turning where high school students actually need access to a five octave for percussion ensemble, for solos, and for practice for college. So that way when they get there, they're not stunned by this instrument, which is now becoming more standard. So we have to just work on figuring out how to talk to the band directors and get that going. But these are my ideas about um, what I think would really help build stronger foundations for a lot of high school students, which would in turn create better college programs which in turn would then create better teachers and educators. And then the system that we're in just gets way, way better from the get go. So that's where I'm standing at the moment. Thanks for letting me talk. This was, this was fun. I'm having a good time. Thanks. Nice. So that was um, a little bit about, again, high schools. And I, I absolutely agree that um, if, you, if you invest more into young ones, it'll pay back if that's what you need as an excuse to invest in them. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, we all get a little bit stuck in the level that we're teaching and we, obviously there's so much to do. So we try to improve that and then we don't pay enough attention to everything around it before it, after it. So I think we could definitely connect better with the high school and middle school level teachers and do a better job. Yeah. I mean, all this just goes back to Casey's original thing of do what you can. It's like, that's not in your wheelhouse to fix that's not in the band director's wheelhouse to fix that's like way higher up the food chain to the admins people making budget and i mean geez uh you know for um we had to talk casey and i years ago about yeah it'd be great if everybody could go to four semesters of each methods class in college but that's that's too many hours like you have to keep it under a cap and um, you know, I, you do what you can. If you, uh, going back to the 4.3 thing, that's, I learned on a 4.3 Keylon and I'm doing just fine. It's not that big of a deal. There's, there's tons of great rep for 4.3 marimbas. Are you doing just fine? I mean, ha we've heard you played the marimba. I think, I, I think we can hear that you were on a 4.3 for a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's you funny. can hear it. You can hear the way he plays anything below that A. It's just like, hey, it doesn't have the same touch below <laughs> A. <laughs> Y'all are <I> assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Caleb, I didn't say anything. I just want to put that out there. Ben, ben you're a you're a you're a gem of a human being for now. For now. Thank you. <laughs> I, I I was just, I was gonna say, first of all, like so well said. Uh what, what was his name, Ksenia? I'm sorry I didn't see it. Nathaniel. Nathaniel, hey, thank you. Like, really, really well said. And yeah, we'd like, we have to keep saying that. I know, I know my high school percussion class, we were like one of the first in like the state, Utah, where our band director, Dan Stoll, what a guy. Like, he's like so responsible for anything decent that happened to me, um, one of, one of many back then. But yeah, he, he let us do percussion ensemble. He, he, he was one of the first to like rally and get his administration to allow him to have a separate percussion class. And just like Nathaniel said, it helped him out because he didn't have to solve that issue with the repertoire. I mean, it's a repertoire problem. Like, what do we do with all these percussionists? And then it's an administration problem. If you have 30 percussionists sign up, you don't want to turn them away, but no repertoire is going to allow for all of them to play. So what the heck do you do? Um, what One thing I love to do, tell students when they say like, hey, we're doing the rakes progress and I have like 9 million cotillion rests and I'm trying really hard not to bring a book and bring a Game Boy and whatever, like, hey, get a score. Put a, put scores in their hands. I know I'm like, I'm like telling the direct over work to directors to do more but if you if again like one little thing you can do give them scores of what you're playing and let them sit and watch because they want to sit and watch they want to be involved and kids love following music i mean it's fascinating you know and they don't do it very much let them sit and watch the score let them follow let them like absorb what it sounds like oh that's what trumpets out of tune sound like and just let them be there and tell them they still got to hit their one triangle note after a tillion rests. And then, of course, the other thing we can do is to just try to keep 
keep making new rep and keep asking for new rep and keep programming rep that has more percussion. It's definitely turning that way. I mean, it's happening all the time. Percussion is getting more and more used, but it's, um, yeah, a lot of kids are going to be hanging out waiting still. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great. We should talk to people and educate them. And these are all the right directions to keep going in. And I absolutely agree with Casey. I think this is especially necessary at a college level, particularly if you are an education major and you're going to be a band director on your own. If you're sitting back there and you're complaining that you're not doing anything in band, but you're not picking up on why anyone is rehearsing or, you know, creating these little sectionals or asking the trumpet to play with the piccolo or whatever, then you're wasting time. You could be, you could be conducting while your conductor is conducting to copy, to mimic, to learn. I mean, following along to the score. So definitely, definitely um, there are ways to, to invest that time uh, properly. All right. So our final uh, video right now is from our buddy ryan ryan carlizzle carlizzle here awesome. he is Bye. hey everyone um i'm making this one of you asked me to make a short video about this response um so i think going in line with what i'm doing right now i'm teaching a lot right now in the dallas like i'm actually in rockwall just off i-30 and Something that, as I've been going, I want to see more of, and I'm trying to do with my students, is teach less quote-unquote like, technique and more movement. Because I think that's what, what people really mean when they say technique, is just how do we move? Are we moving in a way that's not going to cause injury in the long term? And are we moving in a way that's going to give us the sounds we want without uh, unnecessary tension? So I'm, I'm trying to shift more of my own teaching into that kind of perspective and not like you have to do this this way and this is the only right way to do it. Um, so I want to see more like movement based approaches to playing and less technical approaches to it. Number one and number two, um, I want to see more musicians in general being taught anatomy from a younger age and this is coming from my perspective of I'm having recurring injuries from not taking care of myself when I was my student's age or just not knowing better. And now that I, I've done a little bit of research and I know better how our bodies are supposed to function, I'm able to make better informed decisions about how to play a specific way or how to move when I'm trying to play or what should be doing the work when I'm trying to play. Um, and I don't want to get too far into that because this would, I could go on this all day and Casey knows this. So, um, I'll just keep it at that. And thanks for sharing this. Have a good one. Did Ryan. he pick all of this wisdom from you or is it just he's, the glasses? He's mine. He's one of mine. <laughs> yeah. Is this something that you discussed a lot? Um, no, I don't think in particular. I, I mean, I, I feel like I know a lot of students technique, like if I think it's fine, I leave it alone. I, I don't think he got this from me. Um, I think he's, um, yeah, I mean, sounds super duper original. I, I think I definitely tackle it when I think it's needed, um, usually to, you know, to avoid injury and to make it fluid. I mean, I, I think you know they're they're one in the same you know i sometimes think we think of them as like really separated like it's like well if you think about it just right you won't have to do this these like technical things it's like well they, they're actually like you know they're trying trying to describe how to think about it you know when they list the super technical drawings and descriptions i mean they're trying to say like hey this is how you should this i i'm trying to put into text how i'm thinking about technique you know which is this really natural thing um, but no, well said, Ryan. I mean, yeah, good to see you. That's yeah, that's awesome, and I'm sure that it came from from a good teacher. But uh, Ryan is very right, and again, I'm so glad that there was a person who brought in physical health and making sure that we avoid injuries and understand how we move. And Ryan, you're you're carrying the torch on this one. So let us know what you're doing and how you're teaching and you know what you talk about and share that with the world and the world will learn and do better. And that's awesome. Um, so 
the, those were all of our videos. I just wanted to give a shout out to the people who wrote in and said some things because um, I think those were valuable too. Um, we had Purdy Purdy 57 I'm now using Instagram handles. So uh, thanks so much. But they said they'd love to see the prices go down. Percussion is way too expensive for quality instruments. And we absolutely understand. Um, a thing I would recommend is always seeing if you can have a payment plan, if you have to buy a, an instrument or seeing if you can join in with buddies and get something together or rent a space together, seeing how you can handle because you're your collection will grow as you grow older and it'll get easier the more that your career develops, but it is those beginning stages, especially after you graduate or you get out of school, the access to instruments can be tough. So being creative and seeing how you can either spread that cost um, across many months or find friends who you can trade with or like, oh, yeah, I'll let you use my vibraphone if I can use your drum set, whatever, um, that can help. One of the uh, one of the funniest little anecdotes from the podcast history, I think, was when we had Third Coast Percussion. And they said when they were getting started, they had four or five octave marimbas and no tam tam. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. So maybe that tam tam is really important. Maybe not. Maybe you need to get it in three years. Um, then we had Ryder Haynes say more studio spaces across the world, similar to the shed in Washington D.C. Again, there's a bright example. If you don't know what the shed is, go look it up. But um, someone did something right, and that's a good shout out. So check that out. Um, your favorite percussionist said, more funding for fine arts for better gear. It's always a problem fighting for gear. Also, more repertoire for the 4.3 marimba, because Caleb got a, he has to learn some music, um, and he needs to keep up those 4.3. Uh, chops so absolutely one time one time in world percussion group i wrote a piece for them and Cassinia called me and complained about this is so hard can you is there some of these sections you could rewrite for me and i was just like i thought y'all were supposed to be good and that's how Cassinia and i met that is not a lie literally the second or third sentence that caleb told me was i heard you were supposed to be good so again, that is why I'm retiring from this world of percussion. I have heard enough about my performance in the past year <laughs> and I gotta leave. <laughs> also, has anyone taught me about upstrokes? If you're my friend, you know what the joke is. A last few ones. Jay Castillo Music said, I'd like to play percussion instruments instead of pythons and flower pots. So um, we understand. And I'm sure that there is plenty of rep out there that is not for any of these found instruments or whatnot, but maybe this is actually a question about um, who hires you or you know who gives you rep to play. And if you disagree with that, you should have conversations and see in any case, whatever the outcome is, what you can do to learn from the situation. So I, I like this is, uh, I like, okay. Like, I think I've probably said this before, but Ksenia, what's the best piece of music ever written? What? How am I what's supposed the, to know the answer to that What's question? the best piece of music ever written? The Rite of Spring. How do I know? The one you're playing right now. Oh, <laughs> and it's like, it's a trick question, but it's like, yeah, if there was, you know, who's your favorite boyfriend? Who's your favorite girlfriend? The one you have right now, like if there's another one over there, that's that's not good. And so, yeah, like I, I get it. Like, I understand why it's like, yeah, I didn't sign up to play percussion, play flower pots. I want to play marimba, snare drum, timpani, et cetera. But at the same rate, it's like, I think for me, what I like about percussion is like the variety of it all. And it's like, yeah, if, if I'm going to be playing underwater cowbell today, I'm going to play the best underwater cowbell that exists. Exactly. Exactly. Again, I totally understand. You get to develop your own rep. The older you get, the more that you want to choose what you play, go for it. But um, when you're young and if this happens to bug you, I would suggest focus on what you can learn from it instead of resisting because resistance doesn't allow for a lot of learning. Um, Pit is lit said better access to education everywhere, not just hotspots like Texas and Cali, lower cost equipment. Yeah, we agree, we agree. Things need to be better everywhere. So thanks for sharing. Um, and then uh, we had Juan Castillo uh, 9837 said opportunities. I inquired what that meant. I didn't get a response. So we hope you get more opportunities Juan, whatever those mean for you. Um, and then Diego Rubio Lopez said, no competitions, haha. -ha. And I was like, would you mind elaborating? 
Um, I've not heard from uh, Diego uh, on that either, but I guess uh, competitions might be a, a trouble, a sore spot for some. Um, but in any case, um, those were all the ideas that our uh, wonderful audience shared with us. And I just thought that it was lovely and we should we should tell everyone about it. I think it was it was well covered today. Yeah, good job finding all that, Ksenia. And thanks everyone for submitting and listening and, um, and sharing. Ben, <laughs> ben is still going. You can't see the chat, but Ben has mentioned the vibraphone with a battery so many times already. It's bingo. We're just missing one thing in the world of percussion. It's vibraphone with a rechargeable battery. Um, in any case, if uh, you've heard something new here and it excites you, that's awesome. Pick it up and I hope you run with it and help develop the world of percussion in that way. If all of these are old ideas for you or you agree with them, disagree with them, I hope you feel seen. I hope you know now who are some of your allies and the causes that you believe in and you can reach out to them, make friends and, and plot together how you can create better mechanisms for marimbas or stands or whatever, uh, better 4.3 repertoire and send it to Caleb. Um, Cause he's, I haven't even heard that he's good. At least people said that about me once in my life. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I just want to use these last two minutes of producer privilege to say that it really has been an absolute pleasure to get to make this. Um, it is, this podcast has been a huge lifeline in, in my, throughout my career, throughout my education. I love this. I love everything Casey created and these friends that have contributed so much to stories being heard all over the world for free, which is awesome. And it's just been an absolute pleasure to get to be a part of this. And uh, thanks. Your, your favorite producer is out. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ksenia. Good job. I don't know. This is like a this is like teasing, looming news for everyone, but there'll be more to come, and you'll be happy to hear it. I'm sure. So, yeah, tune in. Next episode is going to be just absolutely awesome, and you'll hear more <laughs> about it then. So, thanks, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one, and have a lovely end of your semesters and holidays. Bye. Later. <laughs>